Noah Lyles cements his legacy. The Sen strikes again. It's Tuesday, August 6th. I'm your guest host, John James, and this is Front Office Sports Today. This weekend, Noah Lyles won gold in the 100-meter dash, signed the richest endorsement deal for a runner since Usain Bolt, and could have a signature shoe deal on the way. After cementing himself as the world's fastest man, Lyle said, quote, I want my own shoe, and I want a sneaker. Ain't no money in spikes. The Belgian swim team has withdrawn from Monday's mixed relay event after one of its swimmers tested positive for E. coli, presumably from swimming in the infamous Seine River. According to Belgian media, triathlete Claire Michel is hospitalized as she deals with the illness. The IOC has not yet provided comment as they continue to investigate this report. The Sen has been regularly tested during the games, but pollution levels have varied due to local weather patterns fluctuating. The Sen has been regularly tested during the games, but pollution levels have varied due to local weather patterns. University of Michigan's new head coach, Sharon Moore, faces possible suspension by the NCAA for his involvement with ex-Wolverine staffer Connor Stallions and last year's sign-stealing scandal. Moore allegedly deleted over 50 text messages between himself and Stallions rather than cooperating with the NCAA's investigation. The NCAA even considers Moore a potential repeat violator for recruiting during COVID-19's recruiting dead period. Moore is one of seven Michigan football members listed in the allegations, including former head coach Jim Harbaugh. Monday, the Athletics announced the sale of their 50% share in the Oakland Coliseum, transferring ownership to the same development group that the city sold its portion to last week. The team will get $125 million for the sale. Beginning next year, the A's will play in Sacramento before moving to Las Vegas permanently in 2028. The Coliseum will be converted into a cultural hub that includes housing, restaurants, and even a new convention center. The Nigerian women's basketball team reached the Olympic quarterfinals, becoming the first African team, men's or women's, to reach the quarterfinals of any Olympic basketball tournament. Their reward for accomplishing this historic feat? Facing the seven-time defending champion United States team on Wednesday night. Manning Cast has been a major success for ESPN, but perhaps more importantly, it signifies the integration of athlete-led broadcasts into the mainstream. Owen got to speak with Barrick Prince last week, the co-founder of the Creator Sports Network, about why this style of content is changing sports programming as we know it. I'm joined now by Barrick Prince, co-founder of the Creator Sports Network. Welcome, Barrick. Thanks for having me on. Great to have you on. So the Creator Sports Network, um, I'm just gonna make sure I have this accurate. You license video feeds of, of games and allow creators to stream them on their own social media platforms, provide their own commentary, basically create their own alt cast. Is that the basic picture here? Yeah, exactly right. Um, you know, we feel that uh, the, the time for sports distribution needs a little bit of a remake. Um, the young generation is no longer coming to traditional television. Um, and so instead of trying to change the behavior of this generation and trying to get them to go to television, a place that they don't want to, um, we've decided to take sports to them. Um, and we do that by exactly as you mentioned, which is we license live sports and then we work with content creators across the digital landscape um, to broadcast those live sports on their um, existing social channels with their existing community. And they add themselves as commentary and hang out and watch sports with their friends. And where have you been able to get into this market? Because uh, I feel like there's the there's sort of the, the most mainstream sports, you know, like NFL, NBA, uh, Premier League, I know you guys have some access to. Um, and then there's the stuff that people are watching on Twitch, which is, you know, like video games and chess. And I, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm not, I'm sure there's many worlds that I'm not aware of. Is there some kind of like overlap in, in those worlds that you found? Or are you, are you just going straight for the mainstream stuff? Um, you know, a little bit of both. I think that when you kind of look at the, the content portfolio, you have um, certainly like new leagues, net new leagues, something like the A7FL, which is a seven on seven um, full tackle football league that not a lot of people have heard of. Um, and then into like emerging sports, um, which would kind of be characterized by the partnership that we've got with Big Three um, and the One Championship MMA. So sports that are kind of starting to bubble. Um, and then we're also kind of talking to the Big Three letter leagues as well, um, as well as some of these, as you mentioned, some of the the Premier League clubs we've got some deals with. Um, and you know, I think you'd probably be surprised at 
um, how much the industry knows uh, that uh, they have a problem with the young generation. And um, many of them uh, are uh, really aggressive about trying to trying to solve that problem. And is that problem with the young generation, it, it, do you, is that like an across the board thing? I mean, we hear, you know, soccer is, you know, really, you know, people are, are young people are into soccer in the US and in women's sports over indexes for, for younger fans. Um, is it like a, just everyone is saying, how do we get to the young people? Or is it more like, you know, baseball and golf and, you know, the sports you uh, associate with an older crowd? No, I think across the board, um, almost all of them are looking for a younger audience um, with a couple of exceptions, obviously. Um, you know, the way that the sports business globally has been transacted um, is essentially creating really big license deals with a lot of zeros with traditional television uh, media channels. Um, and this generation um, isn't showing up to television because they don't know where it is. They certainly know exactly where it is. Um, it's that they don't want to. Um, the value proposition associated with watching on television um, is really foreign to this generation. Um, when you think about it, um, every single piece of content that they've ever seen um, has interacted with them. It's a two-way conversation, right? Um, they can like it. They can tweet it. They can uh, make a comment on it. They can forward it to their friends, right? They can make memes out of it. Um, but when they sit down in television, we're literally asking them to sit on their hands, um, it's almost like asking the world to go back to watch black and white television. Um, now, Owen, if you if I asked you to go back to black and white television, you'd probably ask me why. Um, and so this is what many of the traditional networks are asking this generation to do, which is to turn 30 and to pick up a remote control and to literally go back in time to a medium that doesn't interact with them. Um, and so the value proposition is not there. Um, and so sports leagues are having to try to change um, their distribution strategy to to get to young people. Now, all of them have figured out that creators are a piece of that. Um, however, um, most of them will go out and hire a TikToker or an Instagrammer or a YouTuber um, to make a two or a three minute video. Um, and my response to them is always, um, what does a two minute TikTok have to do with your live sport? And how did it actually get someone there to actually watch your product? Um, the NBA's product is not a one minute TikTok. The NBA's product is 2,800 games, live games in a season. And so I'm not exactly sure how getting a TikToker to make a TikTok when a game's not on is actually going to get this audience to, um, uh, to actually watch um, what is the golden goose, which is, which is live sports. And so we're kind of putting that on its head and activating communities that already exist in live and essentially reverse engineering the distribution model into a huge audience of communities that are really already there. I'm wondering just, you know, in real terms, how this is, works out with, you know, the CBS's, Amazon's, Comcast, Disney's of the world who have already paid billions of dollars for, for these sports rights and want that full audience. They, there, there is one place to watch Thursday Night Football. It is Amazon or it is Prime Video as they prefer we call them. And um, so if, you know, the NFL can't then just say, okay, well, Amazon, you get your piece and, and the Creator Sports Network or whoever else, you get, you get your own broadcast. I'm wondering, I mean, over time you can work out these deals, but I'm wondering if there's a way in while, um, while these deals are still live. Really, we kind of look for inflection points in, in these large contracts. Um, and when you look, kind of look at the United States landscape, obviously the biggest one right now is, is the NBA. Um, you're probably not looking at another really major open contract until 2027, 28, when the NHL comes up. Um, but you know, we're having conversations with a lot of these leagues now about um, creating uh, this new broadcast window. Um, so how we've kind of done this um, is we have, we're pioneering um, what is called um, the social creator rights window. Um, we're literally creating new real estate that didn't exist uh, a couple of years ago. Um, no different than not a single person listening to this podcast or literally on planet Earth had heard the word fast channel five years ago. Now, every single media company in the world, whether you're traditional media or sports, has a fast channel strategy for one reason and one reason only. is because it's a new revenue stream. Um, and so 
all of them are aligned to look for new revenue. Um, and so ultimately that's what um, we're helping them do is to create uh, a new window. Now, technically the likes of CBS and NBC technically have this window because of the overall arching digital rights that they've picked up in their, um, in their rights agreements. Um, but um, I'd hazard a guess that not a single one of them actually knows how to distribute market or, or monetize in this window. Perhaps that's true for now. Um, where my mind keeps going is they're already doing it. And sports game production is, is often expensive and pretty involved. And, you know, I know there's technology, you know, that you can just like have a camera with some software that just follows the action. Um, at the same time, I feel like a partnership model might make a lot of sense here where at least you're using their, their camera feeds, um, and maybe other aspects of their production. Um, you know, the, the person, you know, in the, in, in the booth or, you know, in the, in the room picking out which, which feeds go where and doing it live. I mean, there's, there's the equipment and there's the institutional knowledge that's already there. Whereas if you just gave, you know, a Twitch streamer, 10 camera streams and said, oh, okay, have at it. It might be entertaining, but it, it wouldn't be this crisp product that, you know, the, the networks have, have developed over time. So yeah, I'm wondering if, if you see this as something that ultimately merges on some sense, uh, with those, those major broadcasters. Um, absolutely. Um, in three or four years, every single major broadcaster in the world is going to have a version of Creator Sports Network. No question. Um, they have to. Um, they have no ability to get to young people um, and, and, unless it's through changing the way that they do some things. Um, but to, to your point, we're actually already doing that. Um, we're taking an international clean feed. Um, right. So like in the in all of our um, rights agreements, right, for most of them, um, whether it's big three or even the, the Liverpool and the, the Tottenham games or, or one championship, um, they're producing a feed for the world, not just for one broadcaster. Right. So, yes, the United States gets one feed, but Brazil gets an international clean feed, as does all of the other global broadcasters in the world. Um, so we're actually picking up that international clean feed. So we're not spending any money on production. Um, we're literally pulling that crisp cut product. Um, but without um, any of the uh, the local networks kind of um, bells and whistles on it. And that's ultimately what our content creators are, are adding value on. Um, but when you look at the video, it's literally the exact same video that you're going to see on those networks because we're pulling it from the exact same place. Do you have your own advertisers or how, how does that, how are you monetizing essentially? Yeah. So really there's three kind of uh, main monetization levers that we're looking to pull. One, obviously advertising. Um, advertisers are really are the, the main driver of, of content. Um, secondarily to that, um, we've got um, kind of creators as a service. Um, so we're actually working with um, existing leagues and up and coming leagues to basically kind of create a creator infrastructure for them um, as a service provider. And then the last one that is that kind of really exciting to us is, is obviously the, the transactional revenue associated with consumer products, um, merch collabs with kind of content creators. So those are kind of the three main areas that we're looking to monetize. I'm curious just kind of how, how you see the sort of mainstream version of what you're doing. I mean, the Manning cast, I think, is where my mind certainly goes, or I think where a lot of minds go. We also have the Bird and Tarasi show, I think has gotten great reviews. There's the K-Rod show. I feel like more and more, and, and there's sort of lesser, you know, ones with without the big names uh, or not quite that that level of big. Um, I, I feel like, to your point, um, a lot of networks are already moving in this direction and and they're doing it with their existing infrastructure and with their ability to to draw big names, um, there's still that that Twitch verse of you know younger people who, you know they they might not own a TV they they just watch everything through the computers and and they have a different sensibility. But part of me does feel like there's going to be um all you know that competition from from people who you know want to watch an alt cast are interested in that phenomenon, but. Are, but are get drawn in by by something like a, a Manning cast or some big name that is easier for you know a, a Comcast or a Disney to pull in. Yeah, no, I think that um, it's 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 really generational, right? Um, there's not very many kids in their teens um, that no matter who you put, you can put Mr. Beast on NBC, um, and they don't want NBC. They don't know how to find NBC. They're, they have no plans to go to NBC. They're going to wait till Mr. Beast goes back to YouTube. 
right? And so we actually um, look at uh, all of those kind of alt cast things that we were doing long before the Manning cast. We look at that as validation um, from those uh, from those entities that that were actually on the right track. Um, but I'd still kind of hazard a, um, the opinion that. Um, ultimately, they're still trying to drive the audience to a specific destination. And even when you get to watch the Manning cast, you get to watch the Manning brothers or the Manning brothers. That's it. That's your only choice, right? Maybe you could go to ESPN and, and, and watch Troy and, uh, and Joe Buck do the game. But when you're watching on Creator Sports Network, you have literally 40 or 50 content creators that you get to, you get to choose from. Um, if you don't like Peyton and Eli Manning, are you going to watch the Manning cast? The answer is probably not. Um, so what we do is we give you the option to pick of a hundred different Peyton Mannings to watch it with. Though that sounds like you know someone who's going to watch the game anyway, right? Um, and because there's the people who are, are going to watch their creator and like, okay, Mr. Beast is he's doing the Premier League game. Okay, I'll watch the Premier League game, or I'll, I'll you know watch or I'll watch him like blow up something. Um, or and then there's the people who want to watch you know the NBA, the Premier League, whatever, and. Um, and you know maybe they they find these these other options. Um, it sounds like you are you see the big opportunity in the people who weren't necessarily going to watch the game. Exactly right. Um, we are the we're the top of the funnel. Um, we are not the hardcore sports destination. Um, that's a very well worn path. Um, if you want to watch uh, the most professional con uh, commentators on the best network then you go to Fox and you go to NBC. And those are really, really worn paths. And those are people who are already sports fans, who are already planning on being their sports fans. Um, but uh, if no 15 year olds have access to television from today for the next 30 years, what's gonna happen in 30 years? There's not gonna be any more fans to watch because they don't have access to the, the platform in which they're watching. Um, and so we offer teams and leagues essentially that top of that funnel. Um, most of our viewers come to watch the content creator, not the sport. Um, and then they end up falling in love with the sport because they're, they're, their favorite person, the, the content creator, is there watching it with them, engaging with them, answering their questions. And now all of a sudden it's a really, really safe space for them to learn about a sport. Um, instead of walking into a sports bar on Monday night with a whole bunch of football fans and you get really, really intimidated by not knowing what a fourth down is. Well, um, on YouTube and Twitch, you can ask that question um, and people will actually help you learn about what you're wa what you're watching. So we really look at this as as the top of the funnel, as opposed to um, the really hardcore sports fans. Sports already has hardcore sports fans. What do they need sports fans for? They've already got them. Um, what we do is we help bring them new sports fans from a particularly younger demographic that's not going to the distribution mediums that you can currently watch sports. The networks, I think, will solve the just like meeting young fans where they can access it. Like, I mean, there's like YouTube TV. There's I mean, everyone's going to streaming for that reason, because I need to be able to watch stuff on my computer or on my, you know, I have like a projector with an Apple TV box. Like I can get all the the sports I want generally there as long as I'm you know paying for the right services. You can even get them without paying for the right services. But yeah, I think, um, you know, packaging it to fans um, in a way that uh, who, who don't consider themselves sports people. I think there is opportunity there. Obviously, that's one of the uh, major untapped populations is people who are like kind of um, amb ambivalent sports fans. Um, keeping them around, I guess, that, that becomes the job of the creator. And the job of the content, right? You know, the content's got to be compelling. The creator's got to be compelling. Ultimately, you know, when sports really, you know, got really ingrained into this, into society is with the growth of television. Um, and television was the only game in town. Um, now there are so many pulls on uh, on people's eyeballs um, that you have to have compelling content and you have to meet them where they're at um, in the way that they want to consume it. Um, you know, creating a, a, a medium that is a one way conversation where the viewer just sits there and does nothing um, is not appealing to this generation. And so um, the whole industry has to find a, a new way to, to tap into new potential viewers. Yeah. Very interesting stuff. Barrick Prince, thank you so much for joining us on the show. Appreciate it. Thanks for having me on. That's all we've got for today, but a big thanks to everyone for tuning in and a special thank you to all of our featured guests. Tomorrow, we'll hear from some of the biggest players in the industry as we tap you into our Huddle in the Hamptons event from this past weekend. This has been Front Office Sports Today. We'll talk tomorrow.